It's all very silent now, isn't it? It'll come up in a second. Indeed. So we'll just, this is quite a long minute in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How's the weather there? Today it's good, thanks. I mean, it's been a bit rainy, rainy, rainy. Um, yeah. So, and you're very busy, Maya tells me. Uh, no, just that we're just getting in and out of things, and oh yeah, it's, it's yeah, online. Yeah. Online is just a disaster. Everyone seems to be able to reach out because it that you have a lot more time because you're not you're not, enjoying, <laughs> yeah, you're not yes. <laughs> having lunch well i'm delighted to be talking to hamdan majid who's an old friend of mine and what i'm so interested about him is he we called this talk you know from a banker to public servant to civic activist and a malay meet a malaysian change maker but anyway, just as I start this questioning and conversation, um, you know, Hamdan, you, before you set up Think City, which we're really going to talk about, that massive project you're doing in Penang, Malaysia, you were an investment banker for 10 years. And then I think you got a call from Kazana, the government agency, and it said, will you work for us? And you said, I cannot resist. I must serve the nation. Um, did they know at the time the sort of thinking that you had and the way you were going to approach things? I think, thank you very much, Charles, for inviting me to join you uh, in this wonderful conversation that we will be having. Um, indeed, I had a kind of a transition from a career in investment banking into, uh, into, a, into a, an opportunity to serve Malaysia. Uh, and Kazana is the investment arm of the Malaysian government. Yeah, in 2005, I had the wonderful opportunity of being able to join a group of people who spearheaded the transformation uh, journey of making Malaysian corporate sector much more dynamic, effective, and uh, investor friendly. In that journey that I embarked on, uh, obviously that I had the great opportunity to think, to contribute back in terms of what nation building means. And one aspect of that journey that started for me was in the opportunity that came uh, as a result of uh, my own past experience was to spearhead my work in uh, urban transformation. Um, um, it was a whole new area of work, uh, particularly given that you know uh, it was only in 2008 that uh, there was this cover on The Economist that showcased uh, the world has come to cities and uh, whereby we had more than half of humanity today living in cities and it also coincided with the time when i was leading the organization in terms of thinking through how can we reinvent penang as a city hub a city region um and 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 it was an interesting uh, what you call uh, coincidence of a moment both the opportunity of being in kazana being in penang and being at the moment when sit the agenda of cities started getting a greater amount of attention globally yeah. So and, when you, you what, and go ahead, Charles. Continue. You you go ahead. Um, you go ahead, Tom. Then. No, I, I I just wanted to add to say that 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 it was a kind of uh, inflection point, uh, both for Penang for Malaysia, and and it was also the inflection point of uh, the agenda of cities getting a mainstream attention, and that also meant there was a greater amount of need for new thinking. A need to actually re reimagine uh, the, in terms of what would be the kind of solution that is needed to solve because the problems are becoming far much more complex. The, the challenges that are in front of us are only increasing in by the day. You know, these are you know from basic issues of dealing with uh, what cities face with in, in terms of externality about um, uh, congestion to pollution to uh, making cities more livable. Um, at the same time, we also had to think about what would make cities more competitive and dynamic. And, um, and it, it was wonderful to think through all those uh, path journeys that we have made. And for one thing that stood out was that uh, there was a kind of new language that was starting to emerge, where cities have become the engines of growth. 
cities have become the focal point of human civilization and cities uh, you know became the, the point where what they call people or cities was where the battle of uh, uh, growth and development was won or lost and um, and the fuel of this the new economy was actually talent and talent chose cities and, and and it became very clear that if you don't get your cities right in you will not attract the people and talent that you need and you cannot build the economy that you desire so it was in, in that kind of uh, mindset that we had that that we published uh, a kind of analytical work that looked at in terms of saying cities people and the economy are probably the sequence of things that you have to ensure that they they all they all rhyme together and amplitude and create the kind of uh, lift for for any particular city or country to actually achieve success. No, that's an interesting answer. I mean, what once after a few years, then working with Kazana in Penang, being the head of that organization there, you you set up Think City and you called it a prototype, a model for thinking differently about cities, and you used a phrase people based cities. And you also said we need deep-seated, uh, you know, systems change. Business as usual doesn't work. Um, what, what, what did you mean about that? And what is Think City? So Think City was an opportunity to experiment and create a kind of hybrid organization, because more, the agenda of cities is not owned by a singular set or group of persons. Neither in the domain of government, neither is in the domain of private sector, nor in the hands of communities but rather it's the work it is it's, it's an organization that works at the intersection of government uh, private sector and people the, but the core of end of the day is that city has always been about people and people and, and more and more people's agenda is also becoming about cities so the key then lies in sense that how do you ensure that's greater amount of alignment of uh, of every one of the actors to be on the same journey and every one of them uh, working towards a kind of uh, to the same vision and pathway about making cities more livable and sustainable. So Think City was an organization that was established to uh, harness, to crowd in, to create the kind of collaborative partnerships that will allow for these outcomes to be achieved, uh, whereby where the, the priority and foremost was about serving the people, serving, and by serving the people, then you serve yourself. And, uh, and there was a kind of mindset shift that was needed. Most of what has happened, you know, uh, it's been that the case that a lot of what urban management is from the 20th century or from 19th and 20th century, and a lot of the rule books were all written in the past. But we live in a totally differing world, where both from a technology disruption down to a whole new generation, and the problems that we have faced all are contextualized in the 21st century. But institutions and the rule books are all from the past. So there was a great need to rethink, uh, reimagine, and uh, find ways in ways that what do you call? How do you bring institutions? How do you bring the rules? How do you ensure that the private sector and others are able to contribute and be crowded in and so on in the, in the solution making? And I think that was a kind of shift that was really needed, in a sense that you know, twenty first century institutions are needed to solve twenty first century problems, and there was a kind of forward and uh, forward thinking and risk and uh, uh, risk taking that was greatly needed and and think city played a role in terms of how we are able to then ensure that this can be done in a more systematic coordinated and in a manner that will allow each party to be able to manage uh, their own uh, uh, contributions uh, within the boundaries of uh, or limits of the powers that they had and so on so that that's the kind of role that we played and we felt that the institutional shift uh, sorry, the, in, the the new institutional arrangement, the mindset shift, and also the risk-taking nature of what we needed to do was fundamentally needed in dealing with the problems that we had in Georgetown, Penang. And the lessons that we have learned seems to be one that is resonates for solution making for cities around the world. Well, no, I think that's interesting because, um, I mean, two questions here. You know, you, you created a bit of a glue helping to blend and bind different organizations, stakeholders together. And you also talked a bit about creating a new contract, therefore, between citizens, the local, national, state and business. But you mentioned particularly not based on profit maximizing. Now, I think that's quite interesting, given that the capitalist logic is so 
strong, how were you able to shift that balance to a more a, a different approach? Not not easy, I think. No, I, I, I think first and foremost, I think, like I said, the, the rule books had to change. And uh, a lot of what we now in hindsight, uh, you know, we didn't realize that what we were working with was quite pioneering. Today, there's a bigger conversation of the shift from a shareholder economy to a stakeholder economy. Uh, but that back then when we started, that was a period when we had to actually win over people, uh, both government, private sector and community. Uh, and align and not only align them on the same journey but rather to uh, to rationalize with them that the collective outcome can only happen if each party is willing to actually contribute uh, and not only extract uh, each party is prepared to actually participate and take risk at the same and at the same time what do you call accept the fact that you know uh, you can't take everything on the table for yourself so the idea of maximizing returns do not necessarily create the kind of uh, so, uh, the balanced societal outcome. Uh, in fact, what happens in maximizing returns for it is that only one group of persons are able to reap the benefit, while the others, are, are, you know, do not get the net benefit out of it. So there is a need, a kind of need, new contract that is needed between citizen and state and corporates, whereby there, there was a need to ensure that they're kind of, uh, while we ensure that everything needs to work towards sustainability, uh, what we, we ensure what you, that the net outcome serves all parties fairly and equitably. Um, and we had to find a way such that new incentive mechanisms were need to put in place and we had to find ways in a way that uh, this was uh, something that uh, doesn't, or doesn't get thrown out of the box. That, you know, by which you're saying that this doesn't make commercial sense. But I think it makes a lot of great commercial sense by, by ensuring that what you call private sector contributes, invests and so on. Uh, areas transforms and in, 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 uh, in places places uh, what do you call gets reimagined. Uh, citizens get access to new amenities and services. Governments, as a result of this, sees a kind of increase in net net income through improved tax collections and so on. So obviously, there's a kind of net benefit that comes as a result of crowding in private sector. But what it needs to happen is that the, it needs to ensure that that process of profit maximization is done on the basis of um, ensuring that the understanding of the collective needs and also working within the boundaries or rules uh, of any particular uh, city uh, or city government has put in place. I mean, it's interesting because you always talk, w once you later on set up Think City, and indeed, uh, as of 2021, it's 10 years old, um, you, you always called it a think and do tank. And I believe you obviously had grants, so some of the uh, grant giving capacity which presumably meant you could shift things more or less in the direction of your ethics and your philosophy. Is is that correct? I mean, just describe a bit this think and do tank and the grant system and what you were able to do. All right. One of the reali one of the realization when we established our organization was that we 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 had the aspiration to say that there was a need for a city making institute in Malaysia, but as we went towards implementation, we realized that you know while we can put together the thinking. The, the reality is in that question of whether can you walk the talk and can you showcase and, 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 and get people to live the transformation that is that we are envisioning. And that is not easy. And that required a kind of uh, a, a, a composition of team and partners who are more varied. Uh, in fact, I, I think you, you, you use the term to, to many times over in, in your past conversations that we had about uh, teams with uh, uh, what do you call not a multidisciplinary rather interdisciplinary we had to work in not on multicultural but a intercultural thinking um, so those were the things that were the foundations of what we started this number one number two we realized that there was a need to actually go out there and experiment and, and try different things and we had to do this real time by virtue that uh, you can't walk the talk uh, you, you can't ask people to do something when you are not prepared to take the risk yourselves and we had to showcase, we had to actually find ways to show, what do you call, demonstrate, uh, establish benchmarks uh, and find ways that what do you call, we can crowd in and, and, and get our private sector participation. So this was a kind of demonstration effect that was really needed. The third was that as we, brought, as we convinced private sector, there was a need to incentivize. Now, the idea was that, you, that it's actually to, to uh, provide incentives that get people to the tipping point. And, and usually it's either a tipping point investment 
uh, or grant, or it's something that sweetens or it lowers the cost, uh, lowers the cost and, and improves the returns for the private sector. So that way, then you find that that the private sector is, has got greater capacity to take risk, and they are prepared to actually even uh, not only take risk, but rather prepared to also experiment and do things that are different. So you needed people who are prepared to do take uh, what do you call uh, uh, go beyond the norm, rather to do new things. Uh, try new types of businesses, try new ways of actually uh, using uh, urban spaces or you know experimenting with new types of programs, contents and so on. So that was something that I think I believe came about as a result of partnerships and, ex and deep collaborations. There was a kind of, because we operated like a platform whereby we had the ability to bring private sector, government and communities together. And we were, not only that, we were able to incentivize them, be able to uh, create the bridge across all parties. So it was a very active hands-on model. Uh, it was something that you uh, deeply embedded in the space and you had a, a kind of uh, a real-time, not only real-time seat to watch it, but rather you had a real-time role to, to make the difference out there. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting. Can I just uh, go into another uh, area? Because one of the things that strikes me about the whole um, philosophy of Think City and, and what you were doing in Penang was this sense of thinking about the spirit of the place, you know, the role of culture, uh, maintaining historic landscapes and so on. I mean, for those who don't know, the collection of shop houses in Penang, Georgetown, Penang, are absolutely incredible and really wonderful. So in that, I mean, you were also very encouraging that uh, UNESCO gave you world heritage status. And how important was that in this whole process of uh, Kazana and then later uh, Think City? I think the, the Kazana was a unique organization and uh, the fact that they allowed for a, a hybrid organization to be established, you know, being a government investment company, we took the risk to establish a kind of uh, a role model to uh, create a, a, a platform in which that we are able to then ensure gov government, contribu uh, gov government participation, private sector contribution and uh, community's role is created in a manner that will allow us to to uh, ensure that, that this takes place in a cohesive and compelling and uh, focused in terms of driving outcomes that will ensure that this is that you know this is long and long and lasting. Um, and you're right to say that you know uh, that the uh, both the role that Kazana played in establishing Think City, the inscription of the city as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but most importantly, I believe it's the spirit, the people itself, and the spirit of the people who wanted to actually. Uh, get on board on the journey of transformation and change that made a difference and in fact brought about the significant impact. Uh, I probably dare say that what do you call uh, this would not have happened if not for the uh, the role of uh, uh, the individual person, the man on the street, who exemplify what Georgetown Penang is about, the spirit of a place that you know people have, uh, have been in, in, in wanting to actually uh, push the boundaries of uh, a place where people were prepared to actually ensure that 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 uh, they do things differently. You know, uh, by virtue being a secondary city itself, we were uh, we had a kind of different DNA that it was in place. But you're you're right to say that the role of culture in the economy has become far much more significant. In fact, in the case of Penang, the the uh, the role of what I would call culture played in reviving the economic sector is very significant. In fact, it has put Penang in the global map. Uh, since the inscription of the site, and more importantly, in terms of how uh, the investment into the cultural sector, uh, it has resulted in Penang moving from nowhere into into a kind of uh, in the in the radar screen we are now beeping to be to be seen a kind of a global uh, model in terms of how culture can be a, a a real game changer for the economy. Now, and that's very important because in the new age where cities are all competing. Um, uh, we are competing in an environment where we call there is high extreme factor mobility. Uh, money moves to anywhere that offers the best returns. People move to places where they have the greatest opportunity, um, and technology goes to places where what do you call they have the great the, the greatest capacity for being able to actually further its cause. But the only thing that doesn't move is actually is the city itself, its location its natural uh, assets that you have, its rivers, its what you call beauty and character, um, uh, its historical, uh, what you call, uh, urban landscapes, and the spirit of place. 
So do, if you ask, if you have what you can compete with, the, the only things that you can compete with is what you inherit. And making, making the best with, uh, in terms of your natural capital, your cultural capital, and your human capital becomes the only basis how cities are going to be able to, to differentiate itself and compete in the global space. And I think in that context, I think what we have done in Penang is, is an example of what that journey could be like. Though it's still a glass, I, I'll probably say it's, it's, a, it's still a journey that we are still on the way of making. But I'm glad to say that that it's you know we are we are we are we are making significant progress in in terms of showcasing what uh, a differing approach of transformation could look like. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. I mean when I first came to Penang in 2006, 2006, things looked a bit uh, occasionally dilapidated, and then over the years it just completely transformed. And I got the sense of many people who had left uh, the island and had gone elsewhere, Singapore, etc., were increasingly coming back. I mean, have you got tangible impact of that movement back into uh, particularly Georgetown in, in Penang? Is there any sort of evidence think, of that that you were able to see? I, like I said earlier, that we have from a recognition to see that, that, that Penang, Georgetown is a kind of a new cultural icon in Southeast Asia. Definitely, yes. Uh, in terms of, say, that what do you call attraction to talent and so on, uh, that is a progressive journey that we are making. And I believe that as we move up the value added in, in terms of our economics complexity and so on, we are now in the process of, of doing what I call attracting new types of talent, new types of services and new types of uh, activities. And, and as in turn, that requires new talents and, new, and, and, and probably not only Malaysians, but other people from around the region. And that's emerging and that something's happening and so on. Um, but we also see that beyond that, we also see that Penang is emerging to be a kind of uh, 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 hub for newer types of activities that were never there before. You know, it comes. In fact, recently it was ranked as one of the top three hubs for retirement and a place where you want to live. Uh, and uh, these are kind of new ranking and uh, uh, new benchmarks that Penang has been moving up in. And um, you know, a, prob a lot of it this has has come as a result of the change, uh, the journey of transformation that we have embarked on. Yeah, I mean, I think listeners need to know that Penang is one of the most uh, diverse multicultural places in that whole region. I mean, a number of religions and different ethnic groups and so on. Incredibly interesting. All right, but if, in if order I can to... just say this, Charles, if I can just say this, Charles, for those who are the audience that, uh, you know, we are kind of a global technology-based manufacturing hub, but that journey has been what we have built progressively over time from being moving from a port city into a technology-based global hub. Uh, and um, But to make that journey, it's, it's, it has been about reinventing ourselves as an urban hub and as a city. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, you just to, to make everything you, we're talking about here work, obviously, you, you've said often, you know, the bureaucracy needs to change. Um, has it changed <laughs> in order to help you right. make that happen? Like, like I said, that, that, that for a start, Kazana itself was an institution that, that took a new mindset in terms of uh, approaching the uh, problem on hand with a differing solution. It's not very really typical of what we normally end up doing, right? Uh, and Think City is a testament to about uh, the, the willingness to actually do new things differently. Uh, I believe that definitely the bureaucracy itself has seen the kind of transformation and, and obviously at the early phase there was a great amount of skepticism and also maybe even uh, feeling of uh, that it cannot happen. But today I believe after seeing what has happened you know, over the decade long change, um, you know, there's a great amount of willingness to do things different. In fact, I would probably even say that bureaucracy is even going to new pathways, embracing new types of intervention. Uh, and in fact, the language of how they look at things have changed. Uh, the vision for the state is no longer focused only about economic returns and so on. In fact, the, the, the vision for Penang is about a family-focused state uh, that is smart and green. Mm. Um, and so there's a kind of definitely a big shift in terms of thinking that has emerged. But it requires to go to the tipping point. It requires uh, the rule books to rethought, to be re to be reimagined, to work for the 21st century. Um, so it's still a, it's still in a journey in the making, I would say. But that's the nature of bureaucracy because the nature of bureaucracy is such that what do you call? Uh, it doesn't get they don't get uh, uh, what do you call it? It, it doesn't pay to take risk, uh, and usually they end up needing what you call leadership who is prepared to give them the space 
to take the kind of transformation and change that is required. And sometimes that is not too often happens and, and that's probably the limiting factor of why bureaucracy sometimes are not there yet. Yeah, so, so final question. I mean, the Think City ideas I know has spread through Malaysia and even across Southeast, the Southeast Asian region. Um, that's true, isn't it? You've been now, you're, you're being able to do other work in other places across both Malaysia and elsewhere. Is that right? Yep, indeed. I think you're right uh, that what you call, uh, we started as an experimental organization in Georgetown. Today we have expanded the footprint across the country and we are working across to see how we can serve the region. Uh, while we have been actually actively involved in partnering and, 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 and collaborating with various other stakeholders globally, particularly in the, in the space of uh, what I would call uh, uh, in the cultural sector, cultural economy sector in the space of climate change and social inclusion. Yeah, well, look, that's uh, great, Hamdan, for giving us that overview of Think, Think City and Beyond. Um, given that you've just had 10 years celebration, I think we're all looking forward to the next 10 years. So thanks a lot for this conversation. That was great. Thank you very thank, much. Thank, thank you for having me in this uh, festival. You know, I, I find that this festival has been very stimulating. And uh, in, in fact, I think it's one of those things that needs to happen regularly and probably needs greater attention and support. Thanks a lot then. Bye-bye. Bye. So, well done.